good. So welcome to Let's Go Live with Gigi Meyer. And I have with me fantasy sci-fi horror author, E.B. Hunter. But you don't go by E.B. always, do you? No, I, I usually go by Eric. <laughs> Eric, okay. I did not know. Some people do like to keep their initials so it's separate from their um, regular life. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um it's my actual name anyway, so it's fine. <laughs> okay, so Eric, tell us where people can find you. Where do you hang out? Do you have a website? What is your website address? Oh yeah, I have um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, obviously, and I also have a. Uh, um, an account on Vocal Media where I have a bunch of short stories on there. Um, I also can be found on my website that has the link to everything. It's just ebhunterauthor.ca. Okay, so you're out of Canada. Yep. Okay, what part yep, of Canada are you in? I'm in Alberta. So I'm uh, northern Alberta, so I'm, I'm way far north. <laughs> are you an hour ahead or two hours behind? Uh, I'm an hour behind you. Oh, an hour behind. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I just, just want to rub it in. Today was 80 degrees and I was sitting by the pool. What's the temperature there? Uh, uh, I want to say it was about 10, cel 10 degrees Celsius. So I'm not sure what that translates to, but uh, a little chillier. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. okay. I don't like the heat too much. I get, I, I get way too hot. So I'm, I'm okay with it being a little bit chilly. Oh my gosh, you would die here. Our humidity is, you know, it'll be 100 degrees and the temperature will be 100 degrees. So it's 100% humidity with 100 degree temperature. Yeah, it's suffocating. Yeah, I don't think I could handle it. <laughs> Not for too long anyway. Okay, so I'm fascinated. I <clears throat> read some of your short stories and I really want to get into it because um, they are, they are, I'm trying to think of the, they're really edgy. They're thought provoking. And for me, they're a little uncomfortable because they're a little bit too real. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I was going for. So good. <laughs> I'm glad. Uh, glad. Check mark. Job well done. Yeah. <laughs> Which ones did you read? Okay, so um, I read the one apartment. I think it's apartment in 3C. Yeah, in apartment 3C, yep. Yeah. Okay, did you ever have to read a children's book? Like, I can't remember. It was like something in apartment 3A or 2B. No. no. <laughs> there is some no, I... children. Yeah, there's a children's book that's kind of similar in the naming convention of yours. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, let me read what this is. Horror. That one was disturbing. Yeah, that one was, I, I, that one was fun. I, um, I had a lot of fun writing that one. And, and Adrian was just kind of a fun character to to write. Um, that one's actually inspired. Uh, so where I live, there's a there's a green apartment building behind my house. And there's a guy whose name is Johnny uh, who goes out on his deck every night and coughs a whole bunch because um, <laughs> he gets stoned at like the same time every night. So in the, in the summertime, you're just uh, like, I'll have my window open and I can just hear him <laughs> out on the balcony. So I was like, I should write a story about that. And uh, that's <laughs> Dead in Apartment 3C is what came out of that. So you're Adrian. <laughs> yeah, kind of, not really, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so before we get too specific, how did it start? Because you write in three genres and they're very different. Fantasy, sci-fi, and horror are totally different genres. Mm -hmm. I made the mistake of saying one time that they're combined and whew, I got corrected. Yeah. Yeah. There, I feel like there's some crossover elements to it. Um, actually, I wrote a, a sci-fi romance too um, that was published in an anthology this uh, February. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. I feel like there's some sim uh, the that one is called Pink Lights, okay, Pink and Light. the anthology is called Union, and it's got it's this one here. Okay, can you move it back a little bit? Yep. Uh, oh, nice cover. So that's uh, Dragon Soul Press put that one out. It came out in February, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, and and so I just was experimenting with that one, but. Um, I didn't really intend to get into horror. Uh, my book is, is urban fantasy. And then I kind of just, um, 
I had kind of a break between editing and stuff and decided to write something in first person as like a, just as a writing exercise. And I wrote Graveyard Shift. Um, and it kind of turned into a horror and then uh, it got published. So I like wrote a bunch more horror stuff uh, and kind of just went a little bit crazy. Um, and then, yeah, and that's kind of how that happened. And then sci-fi, you know, I just, um, it's kind of like modern fantasy, I guess. It's just similar. It's just science versus, you know, magic. But yeah, I, I, I just kind of, there's similar elements, I feel, but. So starting off with fantasy, um, mm -hmm. and you say urban fantasy, uh, yeah. what does that mean to you? Because I know everybody has a different definition. Does it include magic systems? Does it include ones, magic systems that you make or that mm -hmm. are like common for that genre? Uh, so mine is basically, it's just fantasy in an urban uh, setting. So it takes place in slightly future London. Um, and then it's also a portal fantasy where there's a portal that goes goes to like a secondary world um called the dark realm um and and um yeah so it's basically just takes place in like the modern times with magic and everything um yeah kind of similar to like neverwhere or something like that like uh like that kind of vibe i guess okay so uh misty and scribbles ing you know who that is right yeah <laughs> she's so sweet she's such a doll um, but she was asking, what's your favorite magic system? Like hard versus soft or, um, I'm not sure. Oh. Uh, like, I, I don't know. I kind of, I like magic to have some sort of consequence to using it. I suppose you don't want to have somebody who can just go around, um, doing whatever they want and kind of get away with it. Uh, there has to be some sort of rule. So I guess hard magic systems I prefer versus, I guess, the soft magic systems, like um, the mysteriousness, like Gandalf of uh, not, you know, not uh, really knowing what he's doing or how he's doing it. It just kind of happens. So, um, yeah, I think hard, hard, hard magic systems, I think, are my preferred. Do you make up your own? Me? um yeah kind of uh, it's it's hard to make up your own these days i find because everything's kind of been done so um it's kind of just taking things that i like from from others and and mixing in it's mostly elemental magic so you know um it, it's similar and i guess in scope to you know even what avatar does uh yeah. where there's fire and water and, and that kind of thing um and earth magic um, so it's not, you know, it's not any trailblazing or anything like that, but, um, it's just stuff that I've always really liked, uh, and, and yeah, so put it in. <laughs> well, where do you find your inspiration from that? Because I think fantasy is a huge genre. You know, I write romance and that's huge and it gets, uh, there's so many sub genres. I feel like that's similar to fantasy. Yeah. Um, I kind of draw from everywhere i guess uh, a lot of tv anime like i said avatar is kind of um avatar the last airbender there's a lot of uh magic in that um with the elements um also the anime fairy tale has a lot of elemental magic and things like that um like not to drag Neil does fire magic and and uh and things like that so it kind of just i guess sort of have my own characters and then they kind of have similar traits as far as what they can do magically um, and they're kind of stuck within being able to use only one kind of, of element sort of uh, for their magic. So um, they're not able to, you know, do fire, ice, you know, all this other stuff. It's just it's just one thing and they have to kind of work within that system. So, um, but yeah, just a lot of TV and stuff, right? Well, when they, okay, so when they have their powers, they have their hard magic. Is it applicable both in modern, well, you said future or slightly future London and also this dark realm? Is it available in both? It is, yeah. So, um, so there's, there's basically the, the way that they get their, their magic in my book is uh, from, um, there's these two kind of opposing gods. There's the, the black salamander um, who is responsible for chaos magic. Uh, and then there's the white toad who is responsible for order magic or like your elemental magic. Um, Cause it kind of, it's kind of like based earth based, right? So it's, it's your kind of more natural magic system versus the more um, the dark, 
dark magic system, it, it, the chaos magic, it sucks the energy from the earth rather than working with the earth. Um, so using it too much, uh, like the dark realm is the dark realm because it's um, been sucked dry by the uh, King Anfad um, and, and kind of just killed by him taking up so much power to do all these things, um, his, you know, dark agenda. <laughs> and um, yeah, so there's, they get it from those those kind of gods that I, I made the, that system. Okay, so what is chaos magic exactly? So basically, it's uh, it's magic that's just just it, it's a lot more flexible. So with the order magic, you you you're stuck to one thing. You're stuck to being you know a fire salamander, or you're stuck to being uh, using ice magic or water. Um, and then with dark magic, uh, it's it's a little bit more spell and ritual based, um, mm -hmm. where you can do a lot more stuff. But every time you're doing something, um, you're you're pulling energy from the earth and kind of uh, kind of killing it. Um, and if you're not kind of kept in check um, from using that magic, then you know it, it obviously has dire consequences with with crops and all that good stuff. Well, are so. they even aware of the consequences? You know, because um, I think they, like, characters can be greedy, right? They want to advance their agenda. So if they're doing yeah. that, they may not care about the repercussions. Yeah. And that's kind of Anfad's thing, mm -hmm. uh, is that he doesn't care. There was, um, you know, to get into the, the backstory of it, there was like a, a council and things on the dark realm uh, that kind of kept that magic in check and stopped people from using it. They had like kind of uh, um, these clerics that would go out and, and round up anybody who was using this magic. Um, and then eventually Anfad uh, started using it. And he, he was one of the people who was rounding up the others. Uh, and he kind of just, uh, you know, went full Anakin and <laughs> went to the dark side and uh, and then, you know, kind of took over and uh, took over the whole whole realm um, from there. And uh, he he, he kind of so they would burn dark magic users at, at the stake. Um, and he he used the ashes from that to um, create these demons, which are kind of like copies of himself. Um and they are kind of his, his henchmen and he with utilizing them he was able to kind of stronghold uh everybody in, into doing his bidding and 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 take over effectively um the dark realm okay so bear with me here but this sounds it sounds like you could draw a lot from politics and almost history right so there's yeah. always this like rise to power we annihilate our enemies, and all of a sudden you have a dictatorship. So do you take inspiration from those history and politics? Um, yeah, I, I've, um, you know, social studies was one of my favorite classes, <laughs> along with, uh, with English. So um, I, I do follow that and, and know a lot of history. Like one of my, uh, one of my favorite authors is Ken Follett, who does like historical fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and I like, I love his stuff and, and watching, you know, the, the politics and stuff uh, on, on or roll through his, his works. So uh, I do take, yeah, some consideration with politics and that too. Well, because I was thinking, um, is this one book you have out in this world right now? Uh, there's, there's going to be three, um, and this one, it's not quite out yet. My last beta reader just finished reading it today, so I'm like, okay, cool, now I get to do my final edit and <laughs> send it out, um, and, you know, I've been working on short stories a lot, and that's really great and everything, but, yeah, I want to get back and get this one finished. Uh, hopefully, by the, the end of the summer, it'll be all completely polished and edited. Okay, so have you announced your name? in the name of the series. And if you haven't and you don't want to, I get that too. Um, it's just called the, I just, I've just been calling it the Watcher Trilogy because uh, the, the name of the, the mages in, in the light realm um, that use the elemental magic are, all, are called the Watchers. Um, and then um, the first book is called Into the Gray. Into the Gray. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. That's a good title. Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> thought of it myself. Do you have your cover art done? Um, I have like a placeholder that I'm using. Um, it's not like official, 
uh, I had just like a friend like made it for me because she was like fiddling around with stuff and she sent it to me like, hey, this is what I think you should do for your, your cover. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So I, I've just been like using that. Um, I, I'm hoping to find, uh, get an agent and everything this fall. Uh, and then, uh, so I haven't worked too hard on a cover because like if, you know, I get traditionally published, they're probably going to pick one for me. Oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I don't want to put too much work into it to get my heart broken. But um, <laughs> so I just been using the placeholder for now but it's a really cool cover so like if that was the actual one i'd be totally fine with that it's on my instagram page somewhere it's really far back at this point but um yeah i know it's it's really cool okay so um before we move on to talk about publishing i want to go back and ask the question so into the gray will be the first book and you said it's going to be a trilogy mm -hmm. and so do you already have what well, two questions do your characters know that they have magic or are they um, discovering it? Are they like regular human beings like us and then all of a sudden there's some cataclysmic event that they discover they have magic? And then two, I want to hear about your ideas for book two and three. Okay. So for the characters, they, they are aware of magic. Um, what happens is basically they kind of recruit people. They're, they're a secret organization, the Watchers. So they recruit people throughout the city um, who have been kind of touched by chaos magic. So um, there's been an event that's kind of uh, exposed the demons that are in London to them. And then they kind of get, get a choice of, uh, of if they're going to, you know, join up with them or not. Um, and then from there, they, they kind of go through an initiation process uh, called an ascension, um, which is a ritual where they get their magic. Um, they basically have to have to plea for it uh, from the, the white toad uh, to get the magic um, granted to them sort of thing. Um, and then that's the hard magic, the elemental magic, because you have that black serpent who's basically hogged it all. Is that correct? Uh, and he then like bestows that onto his demons. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the black, yeah, the, the black salamander takes it, um, on the, on the chaos side. Uh, it does that kind of, um, it's more, it's kind of more stolen from him than it is given um, because he's, you know, he's a chaotic being. He doesn't really want to give anything. And then the, the white, the white toad is uh, more of a balancing force um, and, and he bestows it to help balance out the chaos magic uh, that goes out. So it's all kind of about balancing it and, and everything. So um, the gist of it is, is that if there's too much chaos uh, within the world, um, they can draw more magic and open up the portal more to make like a, a an invading army come into the light realm through uh, the Thames in um, in London. Uh, so that's that's what they're trying to prevent from happening. That's like the the point of of book one is they're trying to prevent the army from coming through and taking over essentially the light realm. And then what was question two? so fascinating. I love the creativity. Um, I read fantasy. And I am always mad respect for fantasy authors because I feel like you guys take the creativity to like a whole another level. I want to thank you. Yeah, I want to hear about book two. If you have can share the premise in book three and kind of the direction you want to go. And, and Gabby, so, you post your cover. Yeah, I will do that. <laughs> um, so it's hard to say it what happens in book two without giving away the farm. Um, oh, we don't want to do spoilers. Yeah, because it, it's very much dependent on the outcome of book one. Um, it's called Through Red Clouds, uh, and it's about uh, three quarters of the way written. Through um, Red Clouds. Yeah. Yeah, so Into the Gray, and then Through Red Clouds, uh, and... Yeah, I don't know what the third ones yet, but <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, I had something written down, but I don't remember what it was now. That's yeah, that's future Eric's problem. Um, no, those are good. I always like those that are kind of mysterious, where like they're intriguing, and but you have no idea what it's about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah, like Priory of an Orange Tree. It's like, what does that mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. Um. There's one, I, uh, she's a romance author. She does historical fiction, World War II. 
and hers are the best. And so her name is Suzanne Kelman, but hers mm -hmm. are like, um, we fly amongst the stars or over the rooftops. Yeah. I mean, hers, you know, so just creative that way. Okay, so that's exciting that you have a trilogy. And I know that you writing it, like you'll continue to write it, obviously. Yeah. But if you do traditionally published, yeah. do you feel that gives you a lot more time to work through your series and kind of organize your thoughts? Because from what I, the little bit I do understand about traditionally published, I have a friend who does um, sci-fi and he's traditionally published. Mm -hmm. They will kind of change your manuscript for you. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know if it gives you more, more t I guess it gives you more time because it takes a while for them to say yes, I guess. <laughs> um, it, it, uh, I guess it kind of does in a sense. I don't have that. Um, it takes out the option of just putting it out. Yeah. <laughs> like with self-publishing so i guess in a sense yeah it does give you more time i suppose once it's actually picked up though they would have some sort of deadline for you so it might take a let that you know that leisurely time out of it but um versus i guess it's just a self-imposed deadline which is probably actually worse than having a deadline <laughs> from a publisher honestly but because uh, i would i would just be like oh my god i haven't done it yet that's not out yet what's going on um, where if it's traditionally, it's like, okay, I have till, you know, December, whatever. And, yeah, yeah. you know, they're I very, very structured. But, yeah. So why traditionally published and how do you start the uh, query process? So, um, I, <laughs> I did what I think a lot of people do. I wrote the book in about two, uh, well, about a month and I edited it in about another month. Wait, uh, wait, then wait, I sent wait, it out to wait. about. You wrote it in a month. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How um, the word count what are we talking here so the first one was about um what was it seventy thousand words i think oh my god um, eric <laughs> were you just like oh. yeah something <laughs> like you that dictate? you dictate <laughs> no uh, i just type i can't dictate it i lose my train of thought i don't know why um so yeah i just typed it out and and then after i did that I, I was like cool it's done let's you know let's send it out and sent it out to about 48 49 pub uh, agents or so and um got rejected by all of them uh and then the last one i who was aaron Clyburn, i think her name was gave me like some really like decent advice she's like hey so for fantasy this is too short it needs to be longer okay uh it needs to be like at least you know a hundred thousand words basically okay. I'm like okay and then she's also like, you know, here's some, some resources, check these out, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. And I was like, okay, cool. Sounds good. I can do that. And, um, uh, yeah. So basically I was like, all right, well, I need to beef this up. Um, so I went in and added a whole bunch of stuff to it. Uh, I added, you know, some new characters, a new plot line, you know, and, and basically just, I added a new plot line that weaves through the other plot line. Um, so it was kind of interesting to do that, uh, like, because the world's built, and then you're like, okay, I'm going to introduce these new characters in, like, that are in the dark realm. Um, and my, my beta reader that just finished, uh, she's like, I wish there was more dark realm stuff. I'm like, don't worry, it's coming. And, <laughs> but um, so I weaved it through the other one. Uh, now it's at, like, 108,000 or so. Yeah. Um, that is hard to do because, like you said, your story was set. You thought it was done, ready to go. Yeah. And then just go in and add 30,000 more words and then a subplot. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah, I was, I was kind of, well, that's when I wrote uh, all my horror stuff. Cause I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> like, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm going to do. Like, how do I go back and, and do that? Yeah. Um, and then I, you know, I was like, mm -hmm. I'll, you know, set it aside for now and do some other stuff. Wrote a whole bunch of short stories. And then just had an idea of one of like, you know, well, what if there's, what if we follow somebody who's in the dark realm and it just like completely changed the whole story and it was awesome. But I just had to kind of wait for that, that inspiration of uh, one day just being like, well, okay, that'll work. And then, you know, just going from there. Well, I mean, that's a Good point. When you get stuck, what do you do? Like, you can either get writer's block, you can write yourself into a corner. So what do you do? What are some tips and tricks that you do to get yourself back out? Uh, 
uh, I just keep writing. Uh, just I write something else. <laughs> so I just or or do something that's like really mind numbing, manual labor. You know, um, like I I've had some great ideas while I was painting my house uh, or, or or whatever, <laughs> um, folding clothes. You know doing that kind of stuff just let your mind wander i don't think about your story and just like let your mind go places and and you'll be kind of shocked at what it comes up with once you don't put the pressure on yourself well i like the idea of changing genres it's like a palate cleanser that's genius yeah yeah and that's i was just kind of like i need to do something else and i'm like well, let's do something in first person let's do something it's horror like let's do just something different uh to try and get the gears going again and and yeah, it works, so it, it's good. Well, how long have you been writing stories? Ooh, uh, the year was 19. <laughs> June, I think it was June or July of 2020. No, 2021, it was 2021. Oh my gosh, um, I thought you were gonna say like 2003, you're over here like, mm, and it hasn't been that long. <laughs> no. Um, I've been told that I write very fast. Um, nice. I mean, cause I, 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 cause I, yeah, I, cause I wrote the first book and then I wrote the set, you know, this most of the second book, um, and then got to a plot hole thing that I need to fix, but so whatever. Uh, and More then, and then, horror. you know, I've written, so, what's that? So you're stuck at a plot hole. So you're going to be writing more horror is what I'm hearing. Yeah, probably. I think I've figured it out now. I just have to go and fix it and actually do it. Um, thankfully, it wasn't something that was too much that I had to, you know, scrape out to uh, make it work. But um, yeah, so I just kind of focused on some shorts and then did some short, whole bunch of short story stuff. I I'd heard that it's easier to get an agent if you have stuff published and that short stories are an easy way to get publishing credits. Um, so I kind of really buckled down on that like last June or July or well, something. I, I, um, oh, I think it was on your website. You have a ton of anthologies that um, Dragon Soul Press. Did I get yeah. that Yeah. Right? Yeah. You're in a lot yeah, I've got, yes, I've, I've got five stories and four anthologies with them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I've got one that just got picked up by uh, Starlight Pulp, which I'm really excited I, about. I um, it's called, I saw what, them. What's that? Someone from Starlight, Starlight Outrider. Oh, I don't know if that's Starlight Pub. Oh yes, Starlight Pulp. Yeah, they're uh, they're like a little indie press from Cathedral City, I think, in California. Uh -huh. So uh, they they do like like pulp and noir and that kind of thing. So I wrote kind of like an urban fantasy noir thing um, that involved like Irish deities and uh, and sent them, and they took it. So. Yeah, that, that'll be coming out, uh, I think, in June or July this year. So Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Sorry about my dog barking in the background. He's being rude. I don't, I don't hear him, but I have the same thing over there wrestling on his dog bed. So uh, we'll, see who's, <laughs> we'll see who's his worst. Yeah. That kid. Um, so sci-fi. Where's yeah. the line between fantasy and sci-fi, or do you like to blur it with your works? I don't remember who said this, but somebody said that um, magic is just science that's so advanced that you can't understand it. I don't know if it was Sanderson that said that or somebody oh. else. So that guy's because the thing. Of, yeah. he's, the, he's so brilliant. Oh my gosh! Yeah. Yeah. So um, I kind of just like once I heard that, I was like, yeah. I mean, totally because. You know, how does, I don't even know how a DVD works, like, or Wi-Fi, like, that's magic to me, like, I have no idea. Um, so, to me, I feel like it's kind of similar. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, there are different aspects in it, you know, but there's always some sort of, there's, or usually there's some sort of political aspect to it with either fantasy or sci-fi. Yep. Um, and usually, you know, there's good versus evil. There's all these themes that are overlapping. It's just a matter of if they have uh, a sword or if they have a laser gun. Like, so <laughs> it's all kind of the same. It's like um, uh, fire, the, the show Firefly. Like, that's Western sci-fi, right? Like, it's, or... So it's, you know, I feel like it all can intermingle, just it's, it's whatever you're willing to do, right? Because, like, the elements 
of the genre are this are similar. I th I think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and even uh, horror, really, horror is just it's just magic in like a you know or, or some sort of monster or something in the, in the real world, right? It's just it's basically urban fantasy, right? So. I know that scares me. Like I live in Houston, we have like a high crime rate. I'm all like, eh. yeah. <laughs> Okay, so tell us about your sci-fi works. So sci-fi, uh, what do I have for sci-fi? Well, there's the sci-fi romance, The Pink Lights, um, which is about a um, basically the last human who was out on a mission, uh, got picked up from his cryopod when the rest of the, the crew kind of, um, their, something happened that compromised their pods. I don't really know what happened, but, you know, that's what happened. Um, and then, um, so he gets picked up and kind of uh, falls in, in love with an alien. And kind of, it, the story is just him working through um, basically what it is to, to, to be able to love again, which is kind of cheesy. But, you know, what it is to love again. So, um, and then my another sci-fi one that I wrote was uh, Eric, called Radiation are Days. shorter stories? Yeah, they're just... Uh, uh, short stories yeah would you ever expand them into a series like you know what you're doing with uh into the gray um maybe uh not necessarily those ones but i would i would definitely write a sci-fi book yeah um they're just interesting i mean there's there's a lot that are just yeah it depends on i guess they kind of get dated after a while you know you start you read some of them like now, I read 1984 a little while ago, uh, and I'm kind of like, yeah, they're still using that much paper and all this stuff. Like, this is crazy, <laughs> but uh, I'm like, that would never fly these days. Um, it's like all, you know, paper coming through shoots constantly, and they're, like, editing and fixing it. I'm like, yeah, the well, as soon as the internet kicked in, that's just, like, not possible. That's but, over. Um, yeah, so, yeah. So, My daughter is reading that now because, you know, it's one of the classics, right? And so yeah. she's reading it, and she's like, oh, my God. Is this what y'all used to have to do and this and this and this? And so she keeps fact checking the book, thinking like I was, you know, she's like, like you were uh, an adult during that time. Like this is what you lived through. <laughs> yeah. No. <laughs> yeah, that would be that would be wild. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that would that would have been nuts. Um, yeah, and then uh, the other one that I have is called um, it's called Breeders, and it's kind of a. Uh, uh, I've been told it's kind of like a hands made tale sort of thing um, where there's these, uh, the, the essential thing is that people aren't able to reproduce anymore. Mm -hmm. So they have these nanotechnology that uh, allows it for, for women to carry children. But as a result of that, they basically have these uh, children that not children, I guess that they start off children. Then once they're old enough, they, they are, are basically their breeders. So they, pump out children out of like a factory basically um and it's somebody that's escaping from that and and kind of going off to a, a resistance sort of deal yeah that's all ones about i just those are my only sci-fi ones so how do you know like i understand you know you have these series and your palate cleanser is horror but when you sit down i mean aren't all these voices competing in your head to be written Three genres is a lot. <laughs> um, n no, I guess is a. I don't know. It depends. It it's it's whatever I'm working on is is what uh, I'm working on. Whatever is in front of me is kind of what I'm thinking about. Yeah. Um. So, I do hop around, and generally when I when I do the hopping, it's um it's because I'm stuck or like you know um bored or can't think of what the next thing is so you know that's when i hop to something else um so not not really i i and yeah no i'm not not a whole lot that where i'm like writing something and i'm like oh whoops i slipped into this other character or something oh. right um yeah that's exactly so. what i was thinking because i was like if i i have to write one at a time else everybody starts sounding the same you know yeah. and i uh, taught myself just the other day, I was working on something. I'm like, he doesn't even sound like that. He would never say anything like that. So why, you know? And I would think mm -hmm. with you having all these different works going, it would yeah. be very difficult. 
I think that with being in fantasy, like Into the Grey, I don't know how many point of views it has, but it has a few. Um, because I, I'm so used to jumping POVs, like within writing the book uh, as well, it's it's kind of just that, right? Um, like you just have the, when you're writing the chapter from this person, um, I, I think about it during the day, like, okay, it's going to be a Kate chapter tonight, so this is what I want to you know, do with it and whatever. And um, so the, I, I kind of just prepare for it mentally, I guess, throughout the day and just the back of my mind and, and keep it going and then and then write it. And then, OK, that one's done. Like one time I got stuck and I was trying to write something from one perspective and I'm like, why is this just not working? And then I'm like, oh, because it's not supposed to be from this perspective. It should be a different one. And then I scrapped what I had written and wrote it from that one and just it went right. So, yeah. Um, yeah. I guess split personality, maybe disorder or something. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but it makes sense. Like if you're marinating on it throughout the day, then you can easily slip into the their mindset, the look and feel of how they respond and really slip into that character. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's kind of what I usually do is, is I'm like, okay, I'm, I have like an hour a night to write, um, if that, if I'm lucky. Uh, so you know, once the, the kid goes to bed at nine, it's like, I really have to make sure and, and be productive. <laughs> so um, it's like, okay, I am I need to do this. This is what I want to do tonight. And, and so I'm, I'm kind of like amping myself up for it. So I guess that mental planning is, is what helps me keep it all straight. Well, oh, that's a good question. You know, because you're busy, uh, a father, and you have a career, aside mm -hmm. from being an author, do you feel that having those like limited time and having such a structured schedule forces you to be productive? I think it helps, honestly. Um, you know, I, I don't think a lot of people could just sit down and write for eight hours a day. Um, I think you have to have time to think and time to like plan out mentally what you're gonna do. So, you know, um, I think it was Stephen King in on writing. Um, he said he writes, you know, from like seven o'clock oh. to about 11. And then he goes for a walk and he has his lunch and whatever answers fan mail in the afternoon. So he doesn't write like he's not writing, even though like he writes a million books, but he's not writing tons and tons every day. He's not sitting there at a keyboard for for eight hours a day. Right. So I think it's, it's important to have that sort of break from it. Um, and I think it does, it really does just make you, forces you to be productive. Like you're like, okay, hey, I need to write this time. This is all I have. I need to do it, right? So. Yeah. He said he writes the, um, well, you've read his memoir, right? Yeah. You know, where he writes the first draft closed door because it's only him. And he says that he feels like he's in that world. Yeah. So, um, and then I know like Daniel Steele, she's like the queen of romance. She writes, she'll write straight through sometimes up to 20 hours a day. And I'm like, how do your bones not deteriorate in your chair? And then like Dean uh, Koontz, he yeah. writes for 10 to 12 hours a day. Yeah. It's well, a lot. Seems like a lot. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know if I could I could put that much time in. I needed to move around a little bit. <laughs> like you said, you'd be like, oh, my God, I can't move. You know, after that long, you're going to get, like, deep vein thrombosis or something. Exactly. Hey, you can put that in one of your books. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the writer stands up and just falls over dead <laughs> at a stroke. Okay, so you had mentioned Sanderson. What do you think of his – his everything about him is impressive. What do you think? Um, yeah, he's kind of wild. I haven't read a whole lot of his stuff. Just the fact that he, he, he filmed his, his university lectures and put them on YouTube for, you know, us, us people to watch is just, you know, that, that puts him up in, in my book. And, you know, he's been kind of going through it with the audio books and stuff, trying to get Amazon to pay authors fairly and things like that. Um, I think he's doing the right right thing with those those sort of things and um I'm yeah, so I, I, output how yeah you know the word count that he gets how many books he's publishing yeah. you know being a professor i'm just like you know we always want hacks right there could be life hacks there's work hacks you know relationship hacks, you know and you always think like what is he doing because i marvel at him yeah i feel
like he has way more than 24 hours in a day. And it's not that he's giving out a little bit to everybody. And so he's not good. Yeah. He's phenomenal. Although he yeah. says he likes to use the word said. Yeah. All yeah. the time. And he gets lots of practice. That. Yeah, I guess I think just lots of lots of practice for him. I mean, once you once you kind of have that idea and, and and everything going, and if you stick to a schedule, I mean, you'd be kind of amazed at, at the amount that you can do, right? Like when I when I was writing, like when I when I write, I try and write at least fourteen hundred words uh, or you know twelve hundred words every time I sit down to write, um, even if they're complete trash i try and write at least that much so uh i think just being kind of strict and a taskmaster with yourself goes a lot of a lot of a long ways right so i think that's kind of what he does is he just he has he feels he has to write every day and and he does and then it just it piles up right that must be it because similar to you where he only has limited opportunity he wants to maximize it mm -hmm. so then does that um so i want to talk real quick about your horror but i have a quick question when you're writing and you through all your works, do you plot any of them out, or are you do you just know I need to contain the story from this person's POV, and then do you pants it? Uh, um, yes. <laughs> uh, um, I, so I I usually do like I'm like okay I want this that uh, I'll go like. You know, um, and when I was writing into the gray, I was like, hey, I, I'm going to have this a Jeremy chapter, this a Ronnie chapter, this a Kate chapter, whatever going through. Mm -hmm. And then I'd um, I'd write it like a sentence for like I, I'd write my chapter and then I'd know kind of where I want to keep going. So then for the next chapter, I would write like um, they go to the pl place and do the thing. And that's what happens in that chapter. Right. So then by the time I get back to working on it again. Um, I know I'm in this person's POV and this is what I want to have happen. So I don't like, I don't do like a huge structure uh, of like, I know every single thing that's going to happen the whole way through. Yeah. Um, like I kind of know some stuff, obviously, like you kind of, as you're thinking about it, you're like, okay, well, I know this is going to happen or I know that's going to happen. Um, and sometimes knowing is, 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 is bad in a way because you're sitting there like I, I just want to put it in especially if it's like a plot twist or something right it's like I really want to put this in like now I just like I want the immediate satisfaction you of writing this jump ahead yeah like I'm just like I just want to write this part because I know it's going to happen it's going to be awesome so I just have to wait though um, so I'll go a couple ahead and write this is what happens here so I kind of know and can look forward to it um, but no I don't I don't do like a huge structure I think that it can kind of be a bit of a hindrance um, to some people. Like I, I've uh, like went through the fantasy and sci-fi writers Alliance. I've met a couple people who they don't want to start their book because they don't know how it ends. And it's like, okay, like doesn't matter. Yeah. It, you'll, it'll, it'll come like just start it. Uh, Cause if you don't start it, it's never going to end and it's never going to start either. Right. So just start writing. You don't need to know where it's going to end. Just, just go do it. Keep writing. Well, on your multiple POVs, does everybody get, uh, what am I trying to say, like equal screen time? Or does, you know, does, does everybody get five chapters each? Or no, do you just let it ebb and flow depending on who needs to tell that piece of the story? Yeah, um, exactly. Like, ebb and flow. Uh, whoever needs to tell that part of the story, that's who's getting the spotlight. Um, there's some characters that get more. Uh, there's, like, I have one that's... Um, <laughs> I have one chapter just because I, I don't know, I wanted to, because nobody from the main group was was able to witness an event. I made it from the perspective of a homeless man. So, um, yeah. so there's one chapter that's just that because he was there, and no one else is there. Because if they're there, it doesn't make sense, right? So, yeah, I have a few ch chapters that are just one-offs, like um, you know where they that person gets like killed immediately or something. Okay. Um, That's yeah. super cool though, Eric, because do you think that could end up being like your signature? You know how authors, we tend to look for the same thing in every manuscript we put out. Could yeah. that one off by some irrelevant party be your signature? Could be. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see. Well, time will I tell. Maybe it'll, be, maybe it'll get published and they'll... Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe it'll get published. And they'll be like, no, cut that out. I don't want that. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So, it, no, but no, I, I, I just thought it was interesting because it, it just makes sense. I, I try to do, I, I lean 
more towards omniscient. Like, it's not full omniscient or anything, but I'm not, you know, I'm not going to worry about it. If I need to tell that chapter from the perspective of this homeless guy, then I'm going to do it, you know? So <laughs> it's, it's whatever the story wants or needs uh, to have happen, right? And you can. You're the author. It's your exactly. world. Your story. Yeah, it's my book. I can do whatever, <laughs> whatever I want. <laughs> okay, so horror. Yeah. You have a lot. Well, I did see you have what on that. Uh, tell me again. Bellum, no. Bell. Oh, vocal? Voc Velco, Metro, yeah. right? Uh, uh, vocal, vocal media, yeah. yeah. Okay, let me just ruin the whole name. <laughs> you have 11 published works. I know a few of them almost look like poetry. Uh, uh, yeah, a few of them are. Yeah, uh, yeah there's one, one poetry, uh, <laughs> one poem, Antifreeze, and then Snow is kind of borderline poetry. I can sit, I can, it's almost like a short, a short, a micro story. But yeah, it's poetic in, in its, uh, and it's content for sure. Well, your description. <clears throat> so I was, you know, looking up and down. I think you have eleven published works on that mm -hmm. site, and your writing style is really lovely. It's very descriptive. And so I know when I read Snow, um, you, you're right. It is small. I thought it would read more like a poem, but it was mm -hmm. so beautiful and it's haunting. Uh, that so I um Canada I have the, kind of makes sense now. Was that Canada makes sense now? Yeah, I read <laughs> yeah, it was I'm snowing when I wrote that. We're not um, mosquitoes, humidity that's what we're writing here. So, my one friend that I do writing stuff with, um, she was like, We kind of do every once in a while, haven't done it in a while, but like a writing exercise. And she was like, write a story in 50 words. I'm like, okay. And I was sitting there waiting to pick up my wife uh, from work. Um, so I just wrote that on my phone and I'm like, 50 words, done. And it was snowing and that's what it was. So um, that was a writing exercise. <laughs> I just, it turned out really nice. So I was like, cool, I'll keep that, put that on vocal. It is cool. But the, the, a lot of the works I noticed are either horror or those micro stories, or, you know, you do have a couple, well, one is poetry I saw in there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, mostly horror for my short stories. I have a couple of fantasy ones, um, but uh, not, not as many, mostly, mostly horror. I, I kind of, so um with graveyard shift and dead in apartment 3c i actually have there's eight of them um and my whole plan was to have a collection uh -huh. uh, your own anthology really yeah. yeah and so i've actually i've sent that out to a publisher hopefully they take it i don't know we'll see um <laughs> but uh I, I just finished it like a couple weeks ago um but yeah there's eight stories in it in total and i'm hoping to have it out you know uh, by october because they're uh that's the horror season so um but yeah it's just just kind of uh, it started with the one and then and it's called the collection's called tales from beyond the veil and they're basically all like dead in apartment 3c where they're told in first person from the perspective of of uh a victim of a supernatural uh being or event um so you know they all die in the end spoilers but <laughs> like every story it's just a different person uh encountering something and then um we get to watch them get off basically um it it does end with something that i haven't put up anywhere yet that's uh kind of ties everything together um the few people that have read it have said it's rewarding so <laughs> hopefully it's good but um how, how many uh, of those did you read did you read uh, just the that apartment 3c or and a freeze mm -hmm. uh dead. and then um <clears throat> what's the one with the gray cover maybe that is the graveyard it has the gray the, uh the moth the moth pine, uh moth at the window is it yes wait is it the one with the green no because it's antifreeze yeah yeah i think that that one was gray with like a moth in the center golden a gold moth yeah um okay. yeah so that one's part of it too they're all pretty well I think a part of that collection. Okay, one, you have the best stinking titles. What is the name of this anthology again? It's awesome. Uh, 
Uh, Tales from Beyond the Veil. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they're well, they're told from in from first person from uh, essentially somebody who's dead. So I figured that would be a fitting name. <laughs> well, no, that's what I like about those because um, I I'm biased though. I write in first person, and I really like to read first person because I think it's more intimate, and I think it's easier for us as readers to just slip into the character. Sometimes when they're third person, I understand you. Know, I do read fantasy. Um, mm -hmm. I read, you know, I'll, I do read Stephen King. I don't know what you call him. He seems to be like multi-genre. Yeah. I feel like, like Stephen King is the king, is the king you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. But when you write in third, it's almost like you're not as emotionally invested because there's like a separation. Yeah, like it's like fur that you're writing in first. Ooh. Yeah, like I always think of it um, as the camera lens. So, right. which is, I don't know if it's, you know, just growing up watching so much TV and stuff. Like I've watched a ridiculous amount of TV. Um, but it's just, you know, if it's first person, it's almost like, you know, you're first, you're watching what's happening out of somebody's eyes, right? Where yep. if it's third person, you're watching the cameras back here. Um, you know, if you're jumping POVs, you're just changing where the camera is coming from, right? So, um, yeah, and you're you're just a lot more pulled back uh, with with third person. I mean, you can see a story unfolding, but it's not the same as as feeling it yourself or being in the body of the of what's happening, right? So, I know, and, um, I I like that analogy. And the thing that you continue writing from their POV, even when they're dying or they're dead. I yeah. thought that was really interesting. Yeah. It's kind of, um, I, I, after I had written this, I heard something about uh, about Lovecraft, how, you know, there's uh, something hunting somebody and they're, they're still taking the time to write it out. So I'm like, yeah, that kind of makes sense. So, you know, it's, they're already dead in the story and they're, you know, they're telling the story from, you know, beyond the grave type thing. So, um, yeah, it, I thought it was, I thought it was fun. <laughs> And what is that called when you do that? Uh, I don't know. I, I just, uh, I thought you writing it. You from, it. What's that? I thought you just said it. Oh, I might have. I don't know. I forget. We'll have to play it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone forever. It's gone. It's train of thought derailed. So it's out of here. So do you have, okay, so you're, you said you have the 10th, story or like the conclusion that wraps all the stories up yeah. yeah there's a it's the there's eight in total and that's the eighth story uh it's called judgment um and it's it's yeah it, it wraps it up and all the characters from the other seven uh books are or books uh stories are in the final story okay how does that work you're gonna have to find out <laughs> That's hopefully the draw. Um, that's that's why I haven't put it on vocal media yet because it it ties all of those stories in um, to oh the final God. chapter, basically. No, you can't. That's just like letting all the spoilers yeah. out. <laughs> I know because I'm, I'm thinking like, how is he gonna? And then this one, and then yeah. Yeah. Bravo. Exactly. Yeah, bravo. Yeah. yeah. So hopefully coming to you soon. But that one you want to traditionally publish as well, right? Um, yeah, I was gonna self-publish it, but then uh, it's actually Starlight Pulp, the one who bought uh, who bought Luck. Yeah. Um, they were they had a collection short story collection call uh, for a submission call, and I'm like, let's see if they take it. And then you know, worst comes to worst, I put it out anyways on my own, and and um, yeah, so I just sent it out to them. Uh, it it the submission call ends April, so okay. um, hopefully they. Hopefully they take it. That'd be nice. <laughs> How does that work? What's the timing of it? So it closes at the end in a few days. And then how long do you hear? And then how long before it's um, on the market? Uh, it depends on the publisher. Uh, some of them, like Dragon Soul Press, uh, they're like incredibly fast. They, if you don't get an email the next day, you, you didn't make it in. So like the, the day after closing the email, you're like, you're in. Um, so that, is the fastest one I've ever experienced. Okay, Usually it's between like... Published. They don't work that fast. What's that? That's so 
like traditionally published they don't ever work that fast no oh, it's it's so fast and then they're usually they come out within like three or four months like i think june is when uh june 30th was when the one for haunt came like the submission was done and it came out uh september 30th Dang. so three three months so yeah they come out really quick Good. um and they put out one like every month so they are are busy busy people um usually it's a little bit longer than that to get here back it's it can be you know two three weeks um some of them are like you know i had one that got back to me like four months later it all depends on you know who's running them and stuff some of them are just small you know out of your basement type thing so um <laughs> the bigger ones get back to you quicker um like like uh unchartered magazine usually gets back within like two weeks two three weeks so um anywhere between one day and six months <laughs> okay i know this is so silly but i came across just like a couple of days ago christmas horror like apparently yeah. that's like a huge thing like you had said horror is popular in october mm -hmm. but christmas horror was like santa and all that not a retail kind of like a retelling i guess you'd say yeah yeah um yeah it is a big thing uh um have you ever yeah, there, yeah there, there's a there's a, a comic book called happy uh that grant morrison wrote uh that just came, got turned into a tv show and the first season of it uh it all takes place at christmas time and it's horror there's like this yeah it, it's like insane like <laughs> it's a lot uh, um and you know there's a lot of like krampus stuff that popped up um a little while ago they, I think there's been like six movies now about Krampus and mm -hmm. yeah, and Black Black Christmas and, and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a lot of the, the mixing of the there. I guess there's just something about contrasting that like joyful time of year with with death and destruction. <laughs> <laughs> People like it, I guess. Yeah. Well, also there's um, what fairy tale retellings into horror. Mm -hmm. That's popular yeah. too. Yeah. Have you ever tried? Yeah. Can a one of those? Not really. Um, a lot of them are like the original, you know, Brothers Grimm and stuff yeah. are horrible enough, you know, as they are. So, um, yeah, I haven't really done, done any sort of retellings. Uh, I've got too many competing ideas as it is without throwing extra stuff on there. But, um, yeah, no, they're really, they are really popular now. Um, they're cool. I am fascinated. I feel like you're chock full of ideas. So, like, how many works do you have going on right now? That I'm currently working on? Oh, my God. Because uh, we're going to talk tools next. Like, how do you So, I guess there's got to be, there's Into the Green and, and Through Red Clouds that are technically both in progress. I have a uh, novella, horror novella called Wetlands that I'm working on. Um, I have a short story that's not really going anywhere uh that's kind of all i have on the go right now i have i mean i have a lot of stuff planned but that have actually started so i guess four we'll say four right now um which is kind of a low number it's usually higher than that but eric that's a lot that's a lot they're gonna be some people that watch this and just like yeah <laughs> sorry okay so if you were to just stop today and just write all the rest of your ideas yeah how much time how many years would that take you like no new ideas oh no, no new shiny ideas am i working on them full time or am i working on them like just my current yeah, schedule current schedule current, just current life schedule uh, probably could bang them out in a year and a half maybe two years okay. without editing like just, just writing them probably two within two years i'd say year and a half two? uh including edits and stuff way longer yeah but two years of straight writing of knowing where you want to go for the next two years that's that is remarkable yeah <laughs> i have I mean, how um, does that make you feel like i know i got two years worth of ideas in me oh uh <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's with no new ideas. I, I it's good. I guess it's a little bit. Um, I made like a schedule of of like short story things. Um, just looking at submission calls that were coming up, and I'm like, I'm gonna I'll do this and this and this and that, uh, whatever, and kind of going from there. Um, because I wanted you know to get so many out 
uh, to be submitted and, and hopefully published to get more publishing credits before the fall and stuff. So I have a really crazy schedule lined up for myself. High, high ambition, I guess. Um, oh, I forgot about, uh, actually, I forgot about a project I'm working on. So it's five. Um, there's one called Neon Gods that I'm working on that's going to be a, a novel. So where do people learn about um, these calls? Like they want to write short stories and yeah. do what you do. Where do people go? How do they know where to find them? So uh, Submission Grinder is probably the best one to go to. Um, uh, so yeah, Submission Grinder. it's called. Uh, it's a website, a free website, uh, and you can go on there, and it's it's pretty basic website, but it'll give you kind of links to all the different people that are, like, you put in your genre, you put in your word count, you put in kind of, like, the pay scale that you're looking for, um, you, so you can set those, and then you can kind of go from there to the, the, the websites and, um, yeah, pick, pick the ones that are going to work for you. Um, and then there's also Submittable is a really good one. Um, Submittable is a little, little bit more high tech. Uh, that's who the Starlight Pulp is through. Um, and Uncharted Magazine, that's how I found out about it, was the ads for Uncharted Magazine um, on Instagram. So, uh, but Submittable is really good too. Uh, and they're they're really slick. You, you put it in and, and you can just um, check up on it and stuff. And there's like a whole tracking system for it. So it's really cool. Um, but yeah, those are the two main ones that I use anyway. What is the requirements for a short story? Or is that different? Does it, is that different per submission or per call? Uh, yeah, it varies wildly from one to the next. Um, sometimes they want between, you know, one and 5,000 words. Sometimes they want to have, you know, minimum of 3,000 words. Or um, there's ones... They typically don't go past uh, 8,000 words, usually mm -hmm. 8 to 10, because then you're like a novella, basically. Yeah. Um, but it depends really on, on, on the call. Um, so you kind of just got to go through and, and find one that, that sort of is going to work for something that you already have. Or if you want to, you know, um, have kind of a, an easier time of it, you just find one that looks cool to you and write a story about it. <laughs> Um, that's kind of what I did with, with a couple of them. Um, so I just like with the, the space romance one, um, yeah. I saw the, the call on Dragon Soul Press's website and was like, sure, why not? I'll write a story and wrote it and sent it off. So that's probably the easiest way to do it, honestly, rather than finding some, a home for an existing story, uh, writing one for a submission call, because then you have the idea already. I don't know. That's harder. I think sometimes, you know, uh, authors, they say never write to the market. And right. So then authors will write what they want to write and then try and find a home for it. But you're literally saying write to the market. Yeah. Well, I mean, for short stories, um, I find there, you know, it's not a huge time suck. Um, you're not, you know, a short story for me anyways, um, I can usually write it in a couple of nights. Mm -hmm. So it's not, it's not like I'm investing, you know, years of my life into something for someone else. And I always try and do something like I put my own spin on it and stuff. Right. So um, I, I don't ever want to put in what everybody else put in um, my, my luck story that was just picked up by uh, starlight pulp. Um, that was actually, it was originally for dragon soul press because they had one called trickster uh, an anthology as you call, uh, and it had to be something involving the faith. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to do, you know, regular, um, fairy stuff. I'm going to do something weird. <laughs> and, uh, so I wrote a, a noir, um, like set in like the nineties noir kind of style first person, uh, with these Irish deities, um, and, and went from there. So I kind of do my own weird thing with it, but, uh, I just get the initial idea um from from the submission call and i found it's worked pretty good to get those credits right oh heck yeah so let me ask you this is this story is the structure for a short story different than a novel yes yeah. yes and no uh it's basically a novel but real small <laughs> so <laughs> you kind of want to have it um you know you still have your beginning middle your end um you can leave it at a cliffhanger i've done that a few times where you don't really know what happens to the character at the end um 
And people or you don't just, come you, with you just murder them and then you know they're dead. So, so what? And people don't come at you with pitchforks and torches. not yet. I'm really far away from everybody. I'm very remote, so they would have to come a long ways. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I, I find that you know it, it's it's fairly similar. It's it's I kind of write the, my novel sort of like just a whole bunch of short stories, anyways. Um, like you know, I have my idea of this what this chapter is going to be, and that's kind of how I write my short stories too. Is like this is my idea, and then I just write it out. Um, so it's kind of similar to me, I guess. It's really good practice to write short stories to get, you know, just strengthen your writing because you're just doing everything in miniature. Um, so you get to do it like a whole bunch and then you can kind of get more practice at doing the whole big shebang. I find short stories harder and I think many authors do. You know, it's like when you have to write a log line or when you have to write yeah. a blurb or a synopsis, people are like, oh, I can write 100,000 words, but ask me to yeah. write 5,000 in a complete story, uh. Well, that's kind of, I guess that's your, um, it gives you a lesson in brevity. It's like trying to learn how to tweet and saying things within that short amount of time. It's like, you know, you, you write it out. Like I'll write something just as an example, I'll write something for Instagram yeah. and then I'll go to put it on, on Twitter and I'm like, okay, what can I cut? What is filler words in here? Right. Yeah. Cause you know, um, even, you know, the King himself, he says, uh, he cuts what I think 30% of his book or something every time. Um, you know, because you're, you're, there's so many filler words and there's so much extra stuff that you're writing when you're just like in the zone. Yeah. Um, so it really helps writing short stories and being within that word count um, to not just go on and on and on, right? It, 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 I think it helps a lot with that. So, uh, and for my style, anyways, I like to try and be kind of punchy and concise um, and not do a whole lot of you know filler 20 pages of describing a table and stuff like that so um short stories that kind of work for me i guess <laughs> no i understand what you're saying there's some authors that are like uh narrative heavy law yeah. or setting heavy or you know like yeah. i tend to be very dialogue heavy because i always am of the adage like why would i say it in a narrative when my character could say it yeah well exactly Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Because you really, they should be the ones saying it. Right. So yeah. I agree with that. But I know, you know, with fantasy, there's lots of world building with sci-fi. I feel like there's lots of explaining. Yeah. Um, I think with horror, like, I don't know if you have to really do so much of that. Like I know like some authors, well, okay. Like Dean Coons, not that he's horror, but he does a ton of narrative and sometimes you're just like, yeah, you know, then you I really, I, I really prescribe to the iceberg theory, the whole Hemingway yeah. thing of, of doing, leaving some of it up to the imagination of the reader. I don't want, I don't want to give away everything. Um, you know, if, if it, if, if it sparks debate between two people, cause they saw something differently in their head when they were reading it. Um, I think it's, it's valid, right? So it's good to have that where it's not necessarily going to be the same experience because you can, when you're reading it, you can kind of tailor it to your own expectations, your own, um, your own way of looking at things, right? If you can just have that little bit of a tweak, um, it's going to be more personal for you and you're going to enjoy it more, hopefully, and, and be able to be immersed in the story a little bit more. So I don't want to give away the whole farm and let them know exactly what every single thing is. Um, I want to be able to you know, build the story, build the world and, and leave some things out. You know, like I said, I don't know how, um, how the pods got burst in that romance story. Um, but you know, they did and that's all that matters. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I like it because, you know, readers are smart. We don't give them enough credit for that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think one of us, oh. Are you there? I am still here. I think we're freezing. I think my internet's being weird. Are we back? I can't. I think, I think so. Okay. Yeah, my internet was being weird. Sorry about that. One of the hazards of living in a rural area. That's, that's okay. 
Um, I know we've been on way past our time, so do you mind a few rapid fire questions and then we'll sign off. And I would love to do this sure. again. Uh, maybe in the summer when you have a few of these works out, we have, you know, you hear back. Yeah, so that's, that's, that would be great. I'd love to do that. Good. Okay, ready? Yeah. Paperback or e-reader? Ooh, lately e-reader, actually. Okay, plotting or pantsing? Uh, pantsing, I guess. <laughs> First person or third person? Both. You're killing me. Uh, first person, we'll say. Well, you said first person for your horror. Fantasy is third person. Yeah. Um, and what type of third person? Uh, third person omniscient, I suppose. Okay. Plot driven or character driven? Uh, char character driven. Yeah. Writing alone, writing with a partner, or writing in sprints? Ooh, writing alone, I think. Outline or discovery writing? Uh, uh, kind of both. Very, very, very minimal outline. <laughs> and the rest is discovering. Yeah. Yeah. Write in silence or write with music? Uh, uh, Music without any talking. So just just instrumentals. Instrumental. Do you have a yeah. playlist? I don't have a playlist. It depends on what I'm doing. Sometimes if it's a battle scene, I'll put on like Viking music. <laughs> if it's uh <laughs> if it's something that's like sci fi, I'll put on like, you know, uh dark synth wave or something. It depends. Okay. Um writing with a deadline or at your own pace. Deadline, I think. I like yeah. the structure. I mean, it keeps you on track, but it can also stress you out. Yeah, eh, I don't get too stressed. <laughs> <laughs> Series or standalone? Well, you're all of the above. Yeah, I like reading. I like series. I like series to read. Uh, historical setting, present day, or future? Ooh. All, all of them. the above. All of the above. I'll be about Well, it has been wonderful getting to know you. I have so enjoyed tonight. I tell you, your brain is just like so creative, all the different stories, all your characters. So I definitely want to do this again with you because I just feel like when we talk in a few more months, you're going to be like, instead of the five things you're working on, it's going to be like 10 and you're going to have all these things, irons in the fire. So I can't wait to catch up and hear more. Yeah, it'll be awesome. Yeah. Well, good luck. Have a good start of the summer, and then we'll catch up later. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on. It's been, it's been really great. <laughs> Thanks. Bye, Eric. Bye.